Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Let me tell you something. You know, the first time I heard this term, well, no, not the first time. It's like I, I have not been living under a rock. But, but the first time I had a professional conversation around the term polyamorous was with Dr. Kelly Neff. Y'all know Kelly, right? Kelly and I went to the same school together, very conservative end of the school, where both of us really wanted to study other things. And, you know, as soon as we got out of there, we did. And the first time I heard about this term and the way it's being used in the contemporary world, I asked myself the question, what is it about what we don't know, yet what we do feel, that we are creating a gap between our emotional selves, our mental selves, you know, the parts of ourselves that we're afraid to look at, and then the judgment we have for people that do. Now, yes, I got all of that out of that word, but I got out of that with Dr. Kelly Neff, and clearly the language wasn't really that cleaned up. But I will say that why are we so quick to judging on something that has to do with points of happiness that is so absolutely ancient? However, let me say this, mostly for men. Today, Elizabeth Cunningham is joining me here today, having fully expressed polyamorous polyamorous relationships. What are they? What do they mean? What should you know about them? And how do you get rid of the stigmatization and shame and repressed repercussions from all of the above? If you know anything about the most amazing Elizabeth Ann Cunningham, one of the things you know is she's not afraid to take the conversation to the street. You know, she is a love and life coach. She coaches people. Um, that are primarily, but not exclusively, non-monogamous. But what is it about? It's not about that. It's about love. It's about sex. It's about relationships. And, you know, when you think about the work she's doing, I can't help growing up in a generation and multi-generations of those of us that popped out and we had others that we could look for to help explain what we were feeling. Now, I wish Benny could find a clip from Dr. Ruth because the minute Dr. Ruth came out and started to talk about things, I don't know if people wanted to throw bricks at her or throw tomatoes at her. And then there were the rest of us that said, thank you. Thank you for saying that. So today, stay tuned for what we're about to talk about and ask yourselves, how happy are you really where you are? Elizabeth Ann, it's great to have you. Welcome to the show. Oh my gosh. As always, thank you so much for having me on. It is always a pleasure talking to you. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. So thank you for having me. I got to tell you, I mean, you know, I grew up in multi-generations of my teen years. So let me just start with my teen years and then let me go into my 20s. And this was not a word, but it was a, it was a way of being. You know, before we started to put labels and stigmas on things, there was a way that people in, and I'm going to say late 50s, because I watched my sister, late 50s, 60s, and into the 70s started to behave differently. And it, and it wasn't shamed upon. You know, there, it was like love and peace. I mean, honestly, it was like a new era of let me understand where happiness can be and where happiness is. And, you know, when you come from that point of view, and then you land where we are today, I think I don't understand how we have now put so much shame on love and sex. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think even at the time, you know, there was still plenty of people who had a lot of shit. It's not like everyone in the 50s and 60s was no. like, yay sex. And now we're like, boo sex. <laughs> so there was definitely a lot of, you know, um, a lot of people who were like coming out, like sexual revolution, you know, a lot of things going on in that time. Um, but I, I mean, I could answer this question in a couple of ways. And the largest way I can answer it is that whenever there's an expansion, there's always a contraction. Yeah. Because whenever something expands, there's also the backlash of yeah. that as well. And I think that we're starting, honestly, like I feel like we're starting to come out of the backlash just because we are talking about this more. We are more in an era of like, let's actually say the words out loud. And then the other thing that you brought up too was that we, you didn't really have the word polyamorous. You had the feeling of it. And that's what I had when I first, you know, mm -hmm. um, started having multiple relationships was I didn't have the word polyamorous, but I had the feeling of, I want to explore all of these different ways of being with people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the paradox of adding terminology to something uh. is like, number one, it's awesome because it's like, oh my God, yes. Like this is how I feel. And there's a word and words mean that there's an agreement around it. Like other people feel this way too. Right. So you can be seen and heard, but also <laughs> the paradox is that then we have all these different definitions. Yeah. People make it mean different things. You know, it can get warped. And then also, and I think that this is kind of you know, why is there, you know, still shame around love and sex um, is that then when we have words around it and we create our own meaning around it, and then if enough people have the same meaning around a word in a bad way, mm -hmm. then that thing can be a bad thing as well. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, anyway. I oh, look, I got to tell you, I want to ask you this question because we need to know what gets in the way. Look at I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I certainly have shared it online. I had the best of two moms and then Linda's mom. So I had the best of three moms and a great dad through Linda's dad. But I'll tell you what I learned from the three moms. From my birth mom, who did commit suicide when I was six, I learned love. I mean, this was a woman who was so painfully in a relationship with my dad and just so totally unsatisfied. And just it was just horrific. And yet my dad, he was the full expression of polyamorous <laughs> in a lot of ways. And then here comes my stepmom. So this is what I want to ask you about. Now, what did we, what did us girls learn from stepmom? Mama, we call her mama, Mama Doris. When Mama Doris has her first child at 12 and first child at 13, trust me when I say, her bottom line to us is, I'm going to tell you girls everything you need to know about sex early. And then I'm going to tell you girls, you need to go out and play the field. You need to do, and back then it was called dating. Hello, right? right? I don't know, I'm a little older than you, but I gotta tell you, when my mama talked about this, she did not say uh, polyamorous. She said, you girls need to go date. You need to date Joel, you need to date Rodriguez, you need to date Maria, you need to date, you need to date, just date. You know, mm -hmm. and when, when, when my sisters would date the same guy too many times, she would just say to my sister, Joyce, how you feeling about him? And Joyce, beautiful, drop dead gorgeous would say, you know, I think I'm a little tired of him, but just haven't found anybody. But what I'm really trying to point out is I grew up with that arena and it wasn't without discipline, discipline. It wasn't about respect for ourselves. It wasn't about respect for our bodies, but we grew up in a relationship where the paradigm changed from you meet that person, you date that person, you marry that person, and you do not have sex with anyone else. That was pre-50. Let's yeah. talk about what stops us from being fully expressed, because this isn't about one word or the other. It's right. about repression. Yeah, well, and I think what you were pointing to is that people, and we still have this today, where it's just date one person, but it's still find the right person, though. Like it's still, it's not like keep dating around forever. It's like eventually you have to settle on one, right? So that's not necessarily polyamory, but why I think people are no. repressed. And also I want to clarify too, yes, is please. that polyamory is many loves. Poly meaning many, amory meaning loves. Thank you. 
And so it's not, and it can look a whole bunch of different ways. There's not one way that polyamory can look. And I also think that that's, that's like the beautiful part about it, but that's yep. also like where people get tripped up too. Um, because there's anyway, so, um, but why are people repressed is I think that one, we, we look outside of ourselves mm -hmm. first to mm -hmm. see what we should be doing. And then we have a lot of ways that we should be, we should date a lot of people and then pick one and settle down with them forever. We should just pick one and settle down with them forever. We should, you know, all this stuff around sex and dating. And, and it's also different with like different genders as well. And it's usually very heteronormative. It's like, even now, like even with the more, you know, expression inside of sexual orientation, it's still very much like you should be with, yep. you know, the opposite sex and you should definitely eventually find one of them <laughs> to be with yeah. forever. And so I think why we're repressed is because we look at how we should be. Mm -hmm. And then we try to do that while also mapping our own feelings onto it as well, when it should be the reverse. How do we feel? Yeah. How do we feel? Because I do believe that some people are happier monogamous than polyamorous. You know, just because I talk about polyamory all day long doesn't mean I think it's like better no. <laughs> or the way. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that because I yeah. want to go back to what I said in the introduction. You're a love coach, love coach, period, love coach, right. right? And I'm glad you brought that up because we're not making a judgment on one, the other, and anything in between. Mm -hmm. We're talking about really what is holding us back. And I can't talk for men, right? I don't know how men feel, but what holds us back from being fully expressed in our relationships? What holds us back? You know, look, my mama, my mama was like 30 years younger than my dad. She was in her early twenties, right? When she, right? And then she had us three girls and I love that she was young. She talked with us about love relationships. She pulled out a picture of her dating Mike Love of the Beach Boys. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> so, right? You know, I mean, but she did it in like a fun way. I mean, it was such the coolest thing. I didn't learn, I didn't learn till I was older about shame. And then when I learned about shame, it crushed me. It confused me. Hmm. It made me want to numb myself. You know, it, it shuts us down for asking for what we believe. But I want to ask you this question. Why do we think we have to sacrifice in relationships? What is underneath? Is this all fear-based? What is it? Well, I definitely think it's fear-based. And I think that it's different for different people too. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that I see is, you know, you want to be loved mm -hmm. and you want to. And so you'll do things to be loved that aren't necessarily in your best interest. You mm -hmm. know, someone says that you, and so many people grow up feeling like they're not lovable, not valued, not worthy. And so then you start to date and you have these immense feelings for people. And you're like, I want this feeling to stay. I want this feeling of being wanted to stay. And so I'm going to say what I need to, I'm going to do what I need to, so that this person stays around because I want to keep this feeling. I want this feeling of being wanted. Yeah. And we have that get in the way. And there's nothing wrong with being wanted. I want you to be wanted too. But I also want you to be wanted <laughs> in the way that you want to be wanted. <laughs> oh my God, I so love this question. Because let's just talk, let's just get real here. We don't even, we don't even allow ourselves to ask ourselves that question. We, you know, we're not, we don't, don't do it, right? No, no. Right? When I ask people, what do you want? Blank silence. I'm like, what do you actually, I don't know. I don't know if you could, I asked the question, if you could wave your magic wand and literally have anything you wanted, what would you want? And it's like pulling teeth because we don't ask mm. ourselves, what do we actually want? And I think part of it is because we don't think that we can get it for one reason or another. We don't think that we can get it. It's not possible for us. 
you know, and it's so much easier. Cause when I ask people, what are your problems? What are your challenges? Oh my God, they go on for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's way easier when we, we, we do, we talk about our problems. We talk about our challenges. We talk about what isn't working, how things should be, what's wrong with this. Da, 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 da. And then that's how we learn. We learn through, yeah. I liked what not to do. That's yeah. how I learned what not to do. I'm like, Oh, I, sh I can't do that because then that's <laughs> embarrassing. Or we, I can't feel that way because apparently people hate that, you know? So I'm like learning what not to do yeah. is how I learned. And I want to say something because I just got a text message from one of our listeners. And I want to say, yes, we are talking about heterosexuals and LGBTQ members across the board. This is not a conversation for one side or the other. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask Elizabeth uh, to do a show with me that because this is Pride Month, because we really want to address the fact that you're not invisible. Um, if you are in a, in a relationship with someone of the same sex or trans, it doesn't matter. What we're talking about today applies across the board. It absolutely Are does. Are you satisfied? Yeah. What is getting in the way? How do you operate? Are you able to tell your partner, I love when you do this, but I do not love when you do this. And by the way, do not kiss me with that <laughs> pop culture, scratchy, dang beard you got. I mean, we, <laughs> can't, even, we can't even ask for that. I mean, right? I had a friend text me. It, I had a friend text me. She said, Can I hire you for a half hour? I said, For what? Uh, we're friends. What do you need? I have to tell my partner. I said, Are you breaking up? She said, No, no, no. I, I can't dip the beard. It's the beard. And I'm like, What do you mean it's the beard? It's like the beard. It was okay when it was short, but now it's like all scratchy. I hate it. And now he's worrying that I'm not kissing him. I said, Dude, just tell him to shave. You know, but you see, that is the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. And I also want to say on the LGBTQ thing. Yes. So I, I identify as pansexual, which means that I love people regardless of gender. I'm polyamorous. And so generally no one is safe from my love. That's <laughs> that's my orientation. No one is safe. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I would have had you when I moved to Seattle. And let's talk about this. What does your re relationship look like? Okay, let's give a backdrop. Everybody, 1-800-930-2819. I'm gonna ask you, what does your relationship look like right now? We're not asking you to tell us what you like about it, but how would you describe it? What did it look like? When I moved to Seattle, it was the first time in my life since I was 17 that I was not in a relationship. I was in a 17 year live in the home relationship. And then, you know what I'm saying? The first, so think about this. 1993, I show up in Seattle. Oh my God. <laughs> and you show up in Seattle. My friends are like, she's the only one that doesn't have anybody, right? And they ask me, oh, well, where are you going tonight? I said, I have a date. I'm going with somebody I found in the stranger. And they're like, what? I said, yeah, I'm dating. Well, you're dating who? I said, well, they're like, I'm dating. Like, there's just some really cool people that I'm meeting. I'm like dating. It's like a thing. You just go on dates. And I had to explain this. The hardest part for me was every time they had an event, I brought a different person. Amazing. But for me, I was doing what you said. I didn't have the, it wasn't until 10 years later that my friend Melanie said, we, is, we were laughing at you. We just love what you were doing. We didn't, none of us could do what you were doing. We didn't know how you were doing it. But what was that like for you? And I was like, to be honest with you, I don't even remember what you're talking about. I was just having fun. So can we talk about what is the landscape of relationships that you're seeing for people right now? What is the landscapes of relationships yeah. that I'm seeing? Are people happy? Are they happy? Do they wish they could say to their partner, hello, every Friday night is just not cutting it for me? I mean, what is it that's on the radar? Clearly, we're seeing information that's coming out. We're seeing the studies, the statistics, the mm -hmm. surveys. The we're seeing it in our pop culture movies, right? Yeah, yeah. But what are you sensing that people really would like to have more of? 
when I talk to people, so this is, this is how I break this down. So everybody can apply this. And the thing about this is that you have to be totally and completely and 100% honest with yourself, because that is the number one thing that I see is that we have a tendency to be like, it's fine. It's good enough. But it goes back to like, you know, I'm just going to, if I'm wanted, then I'm going to do the thing so that I can stay in the, in the wanting. But being honest with yourself, look at what does your relationship look like right now? Like if I mm. followed you around with a video camera that can mm. also pick up like your thoughts and emotions, what would that video camera pick up? Like be honest. Like, are you nitpicking your partner every single day? Like, are you having thoughts of like doubt and resentment and then wishing that you weren't? Are you like every time that something feels good, you're like, oh, good, excellent. This is really good. But then you use that as an excuse mm. for when things feel shitty. It's like, well, mm. but on Friday it felt really good. So this is fine. You know, and that's kind of what I see is that people <laughs> excuse and justify yeah. how their relationships are going because they want it to work so badly. Yeah. When what I have people do is look at what is the reality of your relationship and how does that actually impact you? Yeah. You know, this is, let's talk about this for a minute <clears throat> and we'll take this right up to the half break because this is important. What's the reality? Now, I would imagine that you as a top love coach, you as this expert in the field, chances are you probably have to ask that question at least anywhere from three to six different ways for somebody <laughs> to actually answer it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're an expert at it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but the reality of the situation. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that you could be in relationship or not. The hardest thing I ever did was in a 14-year relationship that I knew I needed to end at year seven, my friends did an intervention and asked kind of that question, mm -hmm. but they ask it differently. They were like, don't you think it's odd, Pat, that every anniversary you have, like on that date, like you're the only one available to celebrate it? Don't you think that's odd? Like every year, every anniversary, don't you? So they had to get it in a different way. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get at it, you live a lie. You become unhappy. And can I just point out a word that I've talked about every day this week? Sure. Resentment is the number one offender. Oh, a hundred percent. And right? it's, it's also, and this is the thing that I was, ta I was actually talking about this week with my, I, I do group coaching as yeah. well. And I was actually talking about this with my group is that it's the things that you brush under the rug mm. that eventually kill your relationship. It's the little cuts. Yeah. It's the, they walked in after work. I was excited to see them. Mm -hmm. They didn't recept, you know, they didn't reciprocate the mm -hmm. excitement to see me and they went into the other room. <sighs> you know, it's those little, just things. my heart's it's like hurting. Little... <laughs> like, it's <just> like, <sighs> yeah. And it's heartbreaking, but, but it's not big enough. Mm. It's not big enough to let, to complain about. It's mm. just small enough to brush under the rug and excuse they're having a bad day. They're mm. really stressed. It's okay. I'm fine. <gasps> We're going to go to break, but I want to tell you this. You, you know, Mama Doris, my stepmom, you're up there watching me right now. I know what you're thinking right now. <laughs> I know what you're thinking right now. Do you know how she explained it to the three girls, the three of us? She was from the deep South. That's the only place really. First child, 12, second and 13, right? Dara, Joyce and Doris, my stepsisters. And what she did to explain this, just, and I'm telling you, it, every week there was a little lesson. And we were young, but I remember this one time she was making a bowl of something from the South. I don't know if it was chitlins or black eyed peas, or I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And she had the three of us girls taste it. And it had a little bit of hot sauce and we tasted it. And she's, and she asked us what we thought. And we said, okay, it's not quite hot enough. She did this five times until it got so hot that it was intolerable. And she looked at us three girls and she said, you know what? These black eyed peas are like relationships. And she has this Southern draw. 
She said, you know what happens if you build up your anger, if you think you got a bear under your saddle, if you think there's something caught in your ear or your butt, that's the first one. But if you let it build up and then it's a second and a third, it's like the fifth one. It becomes intolerable. And she took that bowl, that whole pot of black eyed pea soup and threw it out. We're going to take a short break. I got to know from you all out there. I know you're listening. <laughs> what level is your black eyed pea soup? Are you at that level of five that there is no way you can take not one more minute of it when we come back? What do you want the relationship to look at? Come on, you know, let's, let's just get real here. If you didn't have somebody leaning over your shoulder or maybe some belief you had, or even some, you know, religious aspect of who you are, what the heck would you want it to be like? Would you like it to be like me when I got to Seattle and met a very dear friend, became my friend, oh my goodness, when I brought her to one of my parties, who was a fabulous dancer at the once then Leslie lady. Is it like that? Are you just wanting to open your heart and let yourself be guided? When we come back, I'm not talking about it. This is going to be all Elizabeth and Cunningham. But before we go, how do people find out about you? I like that you're doing group coaching. How do people get involved with all of that? Yeah, so my website, uh, which is under construction, but you can get a hold of me. I do my, I do yeah, my stuff. Yeah, I have a uh, email. So love at Elizabeth Cunningham.com. Love at Elizabeth Cunningham.com. You can look at my website, Elizabeth Cunningham.com. Um, it is under construction. Just send me an email. Okay. <laughs> I do I, I I do my reach out very much like we're already friends. It's just like, you know what? Yeah. Just contact me. Just yeah. let's talk about it. And I'm gonna make this really easy for everybody. Also, the producers can weigh in. I'm not even gonna ask you about your relationship, but think about somebody that you can relate to. Is it like Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore in Ghost, is that going to, is that like before he gets killed? Is that like what your relationship's like? Or is it more like, hello, 50 Shades of Grey? Which is it? Which do you want? Is there anything in between? Are you afraid to even think about it? See, this is what this show is about. Are you afraid to even think about it? Is your relationship more like that brand new hit series on Netflix, right? What is that called? First kiss, first bite, first something, just I don't know. rocking everybody's <laughs> world. Or is it love story? Is it that? Or is it a star is born? What do you want? 1-800-930-2819. And you producers don't hold back. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, hey, everybody, welcome back. Um, and again, I don't know, you want to talk about, you know, how would you describe your relationship? We're going to talk about that now. We're also going to talk about the influence of pop culture on how pop culture can establish rules. And you don't really need to say pop culture, but there are rules. And the question is, who's making up the rules? How fully expressed a polyamorous relationships with Elizabeth Ann Cunningham? And by the way, uh, what is that email? I, I just got a text. Can you say that email again for people? Yeah, it's love at Elizabeth with a Z and without an E and then Cunningham cool. dot com. I love it. Yeah. So let's talk about this because, you know, this is where we say, ideally, what would you like your relationship to look like? It's it's hard to say what's not working sometimes, honestly. Yeah. But I think, don't you think it's even more hard? Like, is that a word? No, harder? More hard. <laughs> yeah. Hardest to yeah. talk about what do we really like? Because I'm not sure we've ever allowed ourselves to go there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell my personal story yeah, about this it. is that I, uh, so I've always, I've always been attracted to multiple people at once. And when I say attracted to, I don't mean just like, I want to have sex with a lot of people. Although that's super fun too. Like no slut shaming. Like I do love having sex with a lot of people. Um, but when I say attraction, what I mean is like, I want to know you. 
I want to, I feel love for you. I feel romantic love for you. But I didn't think that that was okay. In fact, I told, I was told that that wasn't okay. And um, so when I got into college, I was dating this guy and head over heels in love with him, like absolutely in love with this guy. But I felt attracted to multiple people and I would, I, on a, a couple different occasions, I got drunk and I made out with some other person. Um, and I felt horrible. And I told him like the next day, but after this happened, like three times, he was like, you know what, I'm out. This isn't the relationship for me. And he broke up with me, which rightly so fair. Um, and what I realized at that time was like, look, no matter how hard I try, I can't suppress these feelings that I have for people. And you know what? Actually, I don't want to. I don't think I have to. I don't, like, so I just started telling people, I'm going to date whoever I want. And at the same time, like whoever I'm attracted to, I'm just going to cultivate a relationship with that person or those people. And then I just started telling everyone, everyone, anybody who would listen to me about it. Uh, and I was just so upfront and honest about it. And so when I went on dates with people, I'd be like, look, like if you're on this train, like other people are on this train too. And so you need to be cool with that. Right. And so when we talk about what do you truly want? What do you truly desire? I really do mean like deep down, what is it for you? Not who you're trying to be, but if you are really, really honest with yourself and you were like, I actually am attracted to you and the people that I talk to, and I talk about polyamory with people every single day and ask them about their experiences, how they feel, what they think about it. And it's every, I mean, it's a broad spectrum, but a lot of what people say is I just want to be able to express the love that I feel for people, the attraction that I feel for people, without having that be wrong, because how is love and attraction wrong? And I also want to have these amazing relationships because I think that's the breakdown inside of what people think polyamory is, is that it's like, because the, the, the most hate that I see on the internet, like from my posts and things like that or whatever, is like, oh, polyamorous people just are afraid of commitment. There's no devotion. It's, it's so easy to be in relationships when you don't care, you know, things like that. When it's like, that's not the case at all. It is deep devotion, commitment, caring, love. And it just happens to be for multiple people instead of one. And so I want to say to anybody out there who's listening to this, who does feel attraction in different ways. And we talked about this the last time I was on your show about the different levels yeah. of attraction. Yeah. Um, but for those people who do feel attraction to multiple people in different ways, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. Look, um, how do we know that the notion is alive and well? Okay. Number one, top charting, oldest female singer to ever make a comeback, top charting song. What's love got to do with it? That <laughs> song was completely, when you hear Tina Turner talk about it, but when you hear the, the interpretation of it, this, this is where she says, look, this is a woman who enjoys carnal encounters, you know, with a lover, but doesn't have to feel this deep emotional relationship. She wants to know that in this song, that look, this it's purely physical. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Everybody knew the lyrics of those songs. Mm -hmm. Everybody can pretty much say every word. This popped out in the 80s to remind us that it's still on our mind. Here we are, fast forward to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And we're still battling with the notion that this is not okay for me to feel this way. And that's why you're doing the work you're doing, right? Because mm -hmm. when you get to the place of being honest with yourself, then you have to do something. Can I, let me ask you this question, because this is like anything, anything in the world of psychology and behavior is this. When you have a new realization of something, 
and you do nothing about it, that creates another level of woundedness. See, it's one thing not to be in tune with what's going on with you. That's <laughs> ignorance is really bliss at a lot of levels. <laughs> Truly, yes. But once you get the insight, whether it's about love, your job, your parents, your car, it, when you get the awareness and you know that the next step is some sort of action and you don't take it, how painful is that for a lot of people? I mean, people are suffering. I talk to people who are heartbroken, who are suffering, who call me, who want to know how they could possibly have what they want. Because, you know, when you, when you realize how you truly feel about something, the other thing that pops up is why you can't have that or what's in your way. And then people see that and, and they're real things too. Like, I don't want to invalidate that at all. Like it's real things. Like I'm married with a kid and we agreed that we would only be with just us. You know, I am like this type of religion. And like, what does that mean for me as a religious person to feel the way that I do? Like there are things already there that people are actually dealing with, but you're right. When you have this realization about who you truly are, how you truly feel, there are all these other things that pop up that are in your way. And it is not easy to deal with those things. Like, I'm not going to like sugarcoat it and be like, you're all good, mm. you know, but it is possible. It is possible to start to take steps, even small steps towards expressing how you really feel and what you really want. And that is probably going to rock the boat. And it is scary. And that's why my show, you know, the tagline is courageously expanding in love, because it does take a lot of courage, not only to be honest with yourself about how you truly feel, but then to start to express that to even just your partner yeah. who you love and cherish dearly, but this is something that might hurt them, that might upset the relationship, that might, people are really concerned about, well, what if we, you know, divorce and then I lose my kids in like a custody battle and I'd rather be miserable for the rest of my life than lose my kids. And so like, these are the real decisions that people are faced with and people are making every single day because we don't have a culture that supports mm -hmm how we actually feel as mm -hmm. humans mm -hmm. and how we express love. Yeah. And you're bringing up something really interesting too. I want to really jump right to that if we could, Elizabeth, and that mm -hmm. is, you know, here we are today and we're, we're asking people, even if you do it within the privacy of yourself, you know, the question really is, are you ready? Are you ready to be honest? Are you ready to, to really truly think about what your heart's desire is. And, and, and do, you, do you feel that you have a space, pl safe place to do it? Because one of the things I battled with most of my life was how to fully express who I was in my sexuality in a safe way. You know, now it's very different, but there are some people that are thinking, I, I, I don't even feel safe doing it with myself. Can't they work with you just, even if it's just on this part, because this is really one of the hardest pieces of this, isn't it? This yeah. piece right here to really yeah. face yourself. Because if you face yourself, then the next step is how do I make it real? Yeah. And I have, so again, like I have my group course and it's eight weeks and the first, and this is not like a promo for my course. This is just to highlight what you said, um, yeah. is that the first two thirds of my course are just about you, mm -hmm. are just about your thoughts, your emotions, your beliefs, your past, you know, what's holding you back? What do you need to overcome just within yourself? And how can you do that in a supported way to get to the point where you can't even express what you want. Cause like we said at the very beginning, it's hard. Like people just draw a blank, you know? And so being able to express what you want. And then the last third, even like the last, not even third, like maybe fifth of the course is about, okay, 
now taking action, communicating all of that, because you have to build that inner strength and you have to heal those things inside of you. I'm not saying take no action until you do that. I'm, but I am saying that there is a lot of inner work that needs to be done to be able to express, say, act, you know, because when you have that inner confidence, it makes it so much easier. Like when, when I, again, going back to my story, you know, when I was telling people that I um, was dating multiple people, and then when I discovered the word polyamory, and so I started telling people that I was polyamorous, I had so much confidence about it. Like nobody could say boo to me about it. Mm -hmm. I was just like, yeah, I, that's, that's exactly how I feel. You either are cool with that or you're not cool with that. <laughs> and then we'll deal with that, you know, <laughs> but, but like, I'm, but regardless, I'm good, you know, I'm cool. Um, and so it really, it really does taking, take, uh, it really does take time to build that within yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's talk about what happens when we're holding what is a secret. See, I want to bring this to a, a, a just up front level. You know, when we have these feelings about ourselves and our desires and we hold back, you know, we're keeping a level of secrets and secrets, as we know, on many levels, we can, you and I can do a whole show on secrets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but secrets, as we know, they, they not only cause internal conflict, but they can cause stress points. They can have you believe that there's something wrong with you. And the secret doesn't go away. It sort of builds up momentum as you go through life and you keep repressing who you are or who you want to be and you hold that back. Yeah. And so part of what we're talking about, and I really want to talk about it now, is you know, if we're not going to have a moment of realization about what we really want, then we're not going to be able to make it real because what will make real is a compromised version. Isn't that, is that, is that on track? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I think also the longer that a secret builds up, the more mm -hmm. fear you have around sharing that secret. Mm -hmm. Because what I found for myself personally, and also professionally with the people that I work with, is that nine out of 10 times when we share who we truly are, it's not as scary as we've made it out to be in our head. Mm -hmm. But when we hold a secret of who we are, like what we think that we can't say, you know, how we think that we can't be, and we don't share it, don't share it, don't share it, don't share it, the longer that it goes, the more dramatic that it gets, the more it's like, but, and then like, and then all this time has passed too. And that gets to be a factor in you not sharing it. Well, it's like, well, it's been a year. So now it would be weird to share it because then I would have to say that I've been holding it as a secret for this mm -hmm. long. Right. So it, it does, it absolutely snowballs mm -hmm. when you hold a secret and not just, and not just snowballs in the fact of like how it gets harder, but also I think as you were pointing out, it snowballs in the fact of it, it's like, I had a friend describe it to me like this at one point, she was like, she was like, I held this inside me for so long that it almost felt like this black ball of smoke inside of mm. my like inside of my gut mm -hmm. and it was almost like this black ball of smoke got bigger and bigger and bigger as time went on and then it became scarier and scarier and scarier at the thought of sharing how I actually felt so when I actually shared how I felt I was so nervous and she she was uh talking about having a conversation with her husband and she was like, so when I actually shared how I felt to my husband, she was like, I wanted to vomit. Like it was making me like physically sick. That's how long. And she was like, and then I had this conversation and it was beautiful. It was like, was it easy? No, but we actually, we talked about it. And it was like this, this darkness <laughs> inside of me was like yeah. released in sharing that. Yeah. I mean, let's let's talk a minute. Let's just kind of look ahead for a minute. And, you know, what we're talking about today, and we started out, you know, talking about this right out of the get-go, get, get, get -go, and that is the idea of being fully expressed. 
And I think we should take these last couple of minutes we have to really talk about the fact that this is not something you have to earn, meaning you don't have to have enough in this column to really be fully expressed. And yet, you know, there are parts of our society and parts of who we are that will tell us we're not worthy of being fully expressed. It's, it's not something that's going to be in my destiny. And I would like for you to talk a little bit about, without names, how you've helped people step into this. A lot of it comes down to trust. Mm. And I think most of us mm -hmm. struggle with trusting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and that can show up in a lot of different flavors like worthiness. Like mm -hmm. I have to be valuable. I have to be seen as valuable. You know, we make these decisions when we're small kids, you know, something happens and we're like, well, in order to be valuable, I need to be strong. That was mine. Mm -hmm. In order to be worthy, I need to be sexy. That was mine. Mm -hmm. And we make these calls based off of something that happened to us. And then we're like, this is who I need to be to survive. And it's a lack, it's taking away from being able to trust ourselves and being able to trust authentically who we are. So when we dismantle that lack of worthiness, lack of value, you know, the need to be strong, the need to be smart. That's a lot of, for people like the need to be smart, need to be seen as smart um, is definitely a defensive mechanism for a lot of people. Um, but when we, when we start to dismantle those, what it comes down to the core is being able to trust ourselves and to be able to trust who we really are, how mm -hmm. we actually feel. And then in that trust, then cultivating an authentic sense of worthiness within ourselves. Mm -hmm. I trust how I feel. I trust how I feel is authentic to me. And in that trust, I am worthy. Yeah. You know, I want to just bring us back to a couple of things here and, you know, really have you talk about this. And it goes back to what we started out with. Why can't you just be happy with what you have now? I mean, how many times mm -hmm. do we ask ourselves that question or Get somebody else will say that, right? Mm -hmm. But that right there is when you get something up in your face that completely negates what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting question. Why can't you just, the minute you put the word just in it, you already know you're going for a low ball <laughs> estimate. Here, yeah. Right? You're like, just, I just want, you know, I just want one piece of pizza. No, you don't. You want to <laughs> eat the whole pizza. Yeah. The mm -hmm. pizza, first of all, is an 11 inch pizza. Nobody on the East Coast eats an 11 inch pizza. That's one <laughs> slice of a piece of pie. You don't really want just one piece of pizza. So we have to get ready and used to really getting in touch with what I want. But what if we were to take it one step further and say, not only do I want two pieces of pizza, but you better put that extra cheese on it. What do we need to do to get there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think when someone says things to you, like, why can't you just be happy with what you have? <sighs> that I know it's so... <laughs> First of it all, is... I am happy with what I have. But well, it doesn't mean I don't want more, right? And that's the thing. Okay, so two things, right? So first yeah. is it has way more to do with them than it does <laughs> have anything to do with you. It has to do with how they feel, what their value system is, whatever they've got going on. That has to do with them. That has nothing to do with you whatsoever. So when someone says something to me like that, I'm like, I say that. I say, I am happy with what I have. Like, well, when then why do you want more? Because I can be happy and want more. There's this uh, word in Japanese that there, and there isn't a word in our language. And this is the thing, it goes back to like the power and also paradox of words. So there's a word in Japanese and I so apologize. I do not speak Japanese. I may be saying this wrong, um, <laughs> but it's Kaizen. 
And it's the principle of being happy, grateful, content, exactly where you are right now, and excited about the future, excited about your growth, excited about what's coming next for you. And we don't have that in our American culture. We have, if you're trying, we have this very divisive culture. We're like, if you're trying to do this thing, it means you're mm. against this thing. Mm. And that's just baloney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, you know, this is a great way to kind of wrap this up until the next time we talk, because mm. somewhere along the line, we were told you can't have your cake and eat it too. So I never understood that because if I actually have my cake, I'm actually going to eat it. I don't yeah, even get, get what that, cake, what is that eat phrase? Your cake. What? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. That, I, I mean, what are they saying? You can't pick your cake out, but then you can't. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> but one of the things that is so important to us is why, this is what I say to some of my really spiritual religious friends. I say, you got to tell me something. Why do you think we were given such immense feelings for love? Mm -hmm. Why do you think we were given that? And what I would like to ask you again is please tell people, I can't wait to your new sites up. Please tell people how they can get a hold of you. But yeah. I'd also love your personal message, Elizabeth Ann, mm -hmm. because this goes so beyond a word, a phrase, a characterization. Mm -hmm. This really goes beyond a fully expressed notion of who we are, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think one thing, and then I'll, I'll give my information. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I really want to say is that I truly believe in people above rules and laws. And I'm not against rules and laws. Again, me either. Don't like, don't get the, don't get divisive with me. I'm not against rules and laws, mm -hmm. but I believe that the, how we construct our society, how we construct our communities should be about the mm -hmm. people first and how we truly feel and what we truly want yeah. and not about suppression or power over yeah. other people. So how you can get a hold of me, my email is love at Elizabeth Ann Cunningham.com. So Elizabeth with a Z and without an E cunningham.com and i'm also um so i also do speaking engagements as well um so if you want me to come to your organization and give talks about communication about um, even leadership connection how to build relationships whether that be personally professionally or both we're very concerned with work-life balance as a society right now um i would love to come speak at where you're at as oh, well. Yeah. And I also and I also have a group course that does help people create and cultivate the relationships that they want and specifically inside of polyamory and non-monogamy as well. Yeah. yeah. And I want to just give a shout out for you because one of the things that I want to say is, you know, when I think about you, Elizabeth, and I think about your work you do, you are all about relationship. It doesn't matter if we're talking about one-on-one -on -one or in the workplace. It is all encompassing. It is how to build them, keep them strong, and make sure you're true to yourself. Elizabeth Ann Cunningham, I love you. I love you too. Thank you so much. I always love talking with you. Oh, it's so great. I want to thank both Benny. I want to thank Lydia. I want to thank all of you. Remember, ask yourself this question today. What do I really desire? All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you.